you fly all over the world and uh, meet uh, essentially everyone, even legends such as uh, Peter Norvig, right? Like uh, it's hard to be more legendary than, than he is. Uh, but you also interview uh, equally interesting people like uh, Jeremy Howard, Tim Detmers, uh, Kagel Grandmasters. The, the list just goes on and, and on, right? JFP, Christopher Henkel. Uh, and uh, uh, let's see here. We have 33,000 followers on Twitter, 57,000 on LinkedIn, 14,000 on YouTube. You're a Kagel Grandmaster and... Uh, you also are 26 years old. Yes. And I'm not sharing any personal details that you wouldn't want shared because how I calculated your age, I just went online and the internet <laughs> told me. So <laughs> the, the internet knows that you're 26 um, and you come from a town in the Himalayas. I do, yes. So that's it, that's it, why it I'm a professional out. LLM photographer as well as I like to call myself. Yes, the the, the uh, scenic pictures that you take, uh, oh man, the, yeah, just <laughs> the, the, absolutely amazing. But so sort of when you look at your dossier, uh, at, at your uh, uh, achievements uh, at the age of 26, that uh, all seems very interesting, very impressive. So maybe let's let's learn a little bit more how you did what you did, how you do what you do. So that maybe I'm definitely interested myself in, in learning from you. Hence this whole setup of a uh, podcast episode so that I can finally ask you the, the questions that, that are on my mind. So uh, Sayab, you grew up in the Himalayas, right? And uh, how was your childhood? When did you get your first computer? Uh, but yeah, thanks. Thanks for the great intro. For, even before diving into the question, thanks for the great intro and thanks for having me. I, I think you're always too nice with the introductions. I think I'm a struggling content creator. I'm a failed podcaster and I'm an aspiring YouTuber. So oh, I'm yeah. somewhat successful you... professional LLM photographer. So that's that's how I describe myself, so to speak. Of course, of course. 57,000 people on LinkedIn, 33,000 on Twitter in this very hard area to earn followers. Uh, that is machine learning and AI. Uh, did you use the phrase failed, uh, failed content creator or aspiring, aspiring? I, would so I, am, I, I wouldn't call it like that. I would say that <laughs> you're, you know, you're the, what do kids say these days? You're the goat of <laughs> con <laughs> content creator, create, yeah, creation for machine learning AI. So what do we know about you uh, right now is that you're very humble. And this uh, always comes across whenever we chat. So you're also very humble. So the audience have to has to uh, excuse you for maybe uh, not looking at your achievements like we do in O in in, uh, in O and uh, appreciation. But all right. So uh, when did you get your first computer? How did your journey start? Yeah. So I I remember it was in uh, 2000 or 2001, and it was a core to duo. Uh, <laughs> Intel processor with 256 megs of RAM, no GPU. Oh man! And yeah. 32 GB of uh, hard drive with a with those floppy. <laughs> I I never figured out. So I was like right around. I grew up right mm. around the time when floppies were going out. Yes. So my father had this stack of floppies, and I was forbidden from touching it for a good reason. And my <laughs> computer had a floppy drive, like my first computer. So that was around the age when I was like three or four, I think. I do remember the floppies very well, and they used to break, you know, like they, they even by carrying them around by, by by them existing, and then you had to struggle to get the data of them. And um, yeah, okay, so it was back then. And uh, did you get into programming, or what did you do with your computer? I I didn't have a manual, so what I would do is. I, and I didn't have internet at that time. I didn't have good internet for a really long time. So I would basically just like click around the entirety of the computer. Like if you're bored, you like the first thing you do is exhaust the installed games. Then mm -hmm. you fight your parents for more and more games, no matter how many they give you. And <laughs> yes. when when you're like bored of that, you like start clicking around everything. Um, so that was the initial phase of like playing around with these things. 
I knew I was like attracted to them. I knew like I enjoyed screen time more than playing outside, playing cricket and all that. Um, mm-hmm. In our school curriculum, we get introduced to programming pretty early. So like in third or fourth grade, that's when I saw basic and we had the usual turtle uh, following the screen thing going on, uh, all of that. So that's when I first found it. What did you see it back then and said to yourself, wow, this is amazing. This is what I want to do. Uh, sort of. Yeah. I thought like, oh, this is cool. Let's, let's see, let's see what this is, but not like, oh no, this is what I'm going to do in my life. I found my purpose. <laughs> no, no. So, 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 so when did that happen that you, you know, you found your purpose? Was there a distinct moment or maybe it hasn't happened yet? I I don't know what I'm doing generally, <laughs> but uh, if I look back in university, mm-hmm. I can only speak about our country, right? Like, so our country's curriculum is especially frustrating in the sense that it, it, it teaches you stuff that, you know, isn't going to be useful. It's all this stuff that doesn't make sense. It's like uh, stuff from, you know, if you like, I've been curating stuff on the internet. That's why I like people sort of recognize me. And for a large language model paper, if you're late by three days, no one cares, right? Like, oh, this is this is like five years old. What are you talking about? Like, Mixtrel, <laughs> that was last decade. Now we're talking about Fixtrel, at least when we're recording this. And then you look at this curriculum, it's like 10 years behind date, right? So it's, it's even crazy. And around that time, I figured that this isn't taking me anywhere. So let me see mm-hmm. if I can study by myself. And at that time, like, I didn't enjoy learning from the curriculum either and that's when i found internet learning and the good thing now i know is like you can find teachers you like so they can be great teachers that you don't like but i found teachers that i like and that's when it clicked mm-hmm. like this this i don't enjoy sitting in a lecture for like more than five minutes of the hour that i'm supposed mm-hmm. to sit there but this is fine like this i can stay up for so that's when like the the seed <laughs> was like put in my head at that time Awesome. Awesome. And uh, we met in, I think, 2017, taking the fast AI course. How did you arrive there? Like, I don't remember many people from India taking that course. And I also ended up there by complete accident. But what about you? I think uh, pretty same. So the other thing I said, I got started with like this internet exploration, right? I think I've done a lot of breadth first searching, so to speak. So what I would do is, uh, as an undergrad, you're told, a, you're told a lot of things, right? This is what you're supposed to study. This is advanced. This is stuff. Like no one studies AI. No one does robotics because that involves millions of dollars of robots. And then I've found people on the internet who like, who didn't care, right? Like all these DIY people who like somehow take their old circuit boards and make robots and whatnot. So Mm -hmm. interacting with these people gave me the confidence to go about the internet and sign up for any, any damn thing I wanted. Like, uh, even if it was scary, of course it was scary. So I saw fast AI and I saw, oh, this, like it has the name San Francisco attached to it because at that time it was in university of San Francisco. And I thought, no way I'm getting in this, but screw it. I'm just going to apply. Like if, <laughs> even if Jeremy makes a mistake, maybe I get into the course. And then I distinctly remember like at 3.58 AM something, I got an email saying I got in and I was trying to write back to figure out if it's like a phishing email or not, because I was like so sure that I wouldn't get into it. Because at that time it was like a still is very prestigious selective scholarship. I was like, no, no way they selected me. I'm sure this is like a phishing email. But even back then, you were trying out so many things, right? Uh, Udemy courses and uh, or was it Udacity? Everything. So where did that intensity come from? I think part of it was like the frustration of. Uh, university not uh, fulfilling me at some level Mm -hmm. propelling me and then uh, I didn't get a scholarship but still my like annual fee or annual expenses at the time were like three or four thousand dollars per year as a student which I think is like a very large amount so I just Mm -hmm. told my parents hey like I'm I'm not doing any drugs I'm not doing anything stupid but like what if you give me one fourth of this to like study on the internet 
and mm-hmm. uh, they sort of agreed they sort of saw where i was coming from and i told them i'll, I'll maintain my grades and what not so that's like i would basically like spend large amounts signing up for any course every course i wanted just to like see what i really like and mm-hmm. uh, i would say proudly at that time that i've done so many courses because at least in university you like way more insecure and you like trying to prove yourself right oh no i i know stuff mm-hmm. i am good i i know this i know that it's is of like all nonsense so i did about like more than 100 courses at that time just like randomly signing up and i don't know how much attention i paid but yeah and then from the fast ai course there were only a handful of people who hung around for longer from what i remember and uh, there was of course you uh, you started blogging right and then uh, suddenly you started to interview all these people uh, like uh, uh, via email first so uh, how did it feel back then to start writing those blog posts were you at all intimidated um, reaching out to um, I, i think you've been interviewed to francois cholet uh, the creator of keras right so uh, how did it feel like did you, did you f- have to overcome s- something emotional there or was it easy for you i think uh, people like even right now you're saying like i interviewed them right i think like anyone giving me an interview speaks more about them than it speaks more about me in my opinion so it's like how great of a person all of these folks are uh, you were to like spare me your time even though like even still who am i right so <laughs> <laughs> you're an absolute legend <laughs> that's who you are but so. okay but uh, um, but uh-huh. yeah no i at that point i was like fairly okay writing cold emails fairly okay reaching out um mm-hmm. the funny thing i remember at that point i was like also i figured out that any time you're signing up for anything on the internet you can ask for a discount and people mm-hmm. will give you a discount So I figured like yes. that sort of grew my ability to write cold emails I'd like whenever I'd be buying stuff buying gadgets I'd like write to the people hey can you give me a discount I'm a student and many times mm-hmm. I got things for free Like even right now this this camera I'm using we talked about this I like got this on a really good discount Sony gave me a good offer even on the TV so that <laughs> habit uh, made me comfortable speaking to people <laughs> Okay o- all right Uh, so now when you go on camera uh, you know i can tell that you're very relaxed but your first uh, your first couple of times when you started recording interviews for chai time data science uh, also no issues no like hesitation if i look back it's it's always cringy right like uh, i like it's it's also this like breaking in with the camera you like un- uh-huh. until you've done it you look constipated on camera <laughs> for the lack of a better word and then you you you're fine like it's 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 nothing right like only only a lens wow. looking at you okay oh wow I, i really want to get to that point myself so what is your recipe to stop looking constipated on camera <laughs> <laughs> um i i, I think you you you're like you're pretty natural as well but uh, i don't think i am so natural uh, still still comes hard um just like making bad videos consistently that get less mm-hmm. bad so slowly slowly improving that's that's work for me yes th- th- there's something about uh, achieving um something via quantity right would you say that you're a firm believer of that because if i look back at what you did you wrote over a thousand blog posts i think right <laughs> only like 50 or 100 less than 100 for no, sure no 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 No, impossible. Impossible. Like <laughs> the LinkedIn posts, uh, tweets, uh, if you add all that up, that's, uh, that's a humongous amount. And you set yourself quantity goals, right? Like each year you do this thing where you publish your goals for the next year. You do it publicly, right? So for 2024, we have workout 500 hours. We have uh, spent 1,000 hours building with large uh, language models, uh, produced 25 hands-on videos, read for 500 hours. So those are all quantity goals, right? You're not saying that um, 
why do you think they work so well versus saying, oh, I'm going to create a video that will get uh, 100,000 views? I, uh, I used to do that, at least in my head, not sure if publicly, but I think it's, it's more input, controlling the input rather than output, right? So I don't mm. know what I don't know. Uh, for the longest time, now it's not the case, but for the longest time, my most popular blog was how to install CUDA because I think mm. I was the only one who wrote it correctly at that point. And that had like 300,000 reads at that point, which which was just dumb, stupid, right? Like I've written, like I've I've interviewed Ian Goodfellow, Francois Chole, Jeremy Howard, like go, yes. go read that, go watch that. No, everyone wants to read about CUDA. So <laughs> it's the Pareto principle, but the thing that's in my hands would be the input, right? So it's like, all right, let's see what inputs can I control. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, via quantity, you also change yourself, right? Because you, earlier you mentioned uh, create a lot of uh, videos that suck so that you can, that's, that's, but that's, that, that's for many people, that's emotionally extremely hard to keep doing that over and over again while they're not seeing the results. So uh, I remember when you started blogging, you would publish two blog posts a week. Was it? Two blog yes. posts a week. Yes. And some of them got maybe, I don't know, 10 reads, 20 reads, right? There were such blog posts. How did you feel? How did you motivate yourself to keep going? I didn't care, right? Like, because when you start, like, uh, like it's, even the recognition I got is, like, beyond what I would have ever imagined. So, I remember when I wrote my first tutorial on a CNN, that was, like, my first post. I I also reached out to you for reviewing it. So still still thankful for that. But I remember as soon as I hit publish, I was like refreshing. Oh, like this is like where are my million readers? Like where are they? Where are they? Like mm-hmm. and then like an hour into refreshing, I got like one reader, and I was so I was so so happy. So even even still, right? Like even still, if ten people see my stuff, I'm like still happy. Wow, so that, that's amazing. Those small wins, they motivate you. You're happy about them. Well, that's, that's so amazing in, in this world that we live where we are bombarded with vanity metrics and people compare themselves. So I have this many followers, I have this many followers. But for somebody starting out, that's not the recipe, right? If you start looking at views, <laughs> you will get discouraged within uh, two attempts and, and then you're done. So following your recipe and uh, it's hard, but uh, uh, I, I'm learning from you here. So thank you so much for sharing the secret uh, that uh, that is uh, fantastic. All right. And uh, uh, very recently you got into LLMs, right? Uh, yes. Why so? Why so? I don't know. I, I found it super cool. So I, I like still regretted it. I remember I was I was so angry. Um, so you were joking that I, I traveled a lot because I had this phase like where I was just like on the move. And mm-hmm. uh, I basically changed my time zone like 13 times in a span of two months. And these two months just happened to be around the time when ChatGPT was released. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't care less about ChatGPT at that point because, hey, I'm like, I'm in Prague, now I'm in Brisbane, now I'm in like uh, Sydney, I'm in Singapore. And like, for me, that's like, that was crazy, right? And I thought like, ah, this Mm -hmm. is just like something people are like bored, they're talking about stuff on the internet. And then in March, I like, I was back home, I was bored as usual, and I saw GPT-4 release. And then I got to try it and I like, I knew that this is, and like, first thing I did was like, hate myself for not seeing this earlier. And second thing I knew that I have to like, figure this out, uh, whatever this is, understand prompting and go from there. But why? Why did you have to figure it out? What's in it for you? I'm trying to think now because like, I never thought about it like that. Um, there's but nothing you've in it. Sorry. Uh-huh. You, you, you've been going for so many months at LLMs, just learning about them, sharing about them. Why? Yeah, so I, I can speak about the journey. Um, mm-hmm. But why did I decide to go into it, right? Like that's, I don't know, like same as why I got to decide 
to do computer science which didn't fulfill me then ai which sort of fulfilled me then podcasting then video making it's like uh if i sign up for something now like i i want to sign up for something that i can see myself doing for 10000 hours uh, then i mm-hmm. can like say oh i aspire to be like an expert in this and that felt like one of those things that i can spend a long long time doing and so you are genuinely excited about the llms yes 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 what is the most exciting thing for you it just like i feel like i am only knowledgeable and smart about <laughs> even if i am like so little things and then there is this like thing that has all of this knowledge that mm-hmm. i can talk to and learn from it right so mm-hmm. for example right now like i i i got interested in buying a watch and i have been like emotionally talking to gpt4 like oh i like this watch but i don't like that and it understands and talks to me because it also knows about that but then on the flip side it also knows like how my dependencies are messed up and how to solve that just by looking at logs that like i can't even find the line where it saw that um so probably that no, that is so impressive that is a technology that is so impressive it feels like it's from the future and it's here and we can play with it okay makes uh, makes a lot of sense so you you think you will stay in the LLM world for for a bit longer? I think so. Uh, the reason why I decided to like read those papers and do all of that was I saw at that time that like what's happening. So there were multiple factors. Usually the VC market has leverage because as a VC they would have invested into so many startups. They know what one single startup doesn't do. But if you read the A16Z blogs from at that point, they they were exactly what everyone was talking on Twitter about, right? And they were very similar to what the papers were talking about. So I figured, I don't know any VCs. I don't know anyone in that world. Now I know some. Um, I don't, I can't stay on Twitter all day. But I can read papers. And that sort of puts me in the same knowledge bracket. So let me use mm-hmm. that as an opportunity to stay updated and then of course like uh, i think unless i set like a very hard goal that actually like scares me oh shoot like if i don't do this like my i'm i'm done like i, I set this hard goal now to prove myself if i don't do that it's, if it's a lazy goal that i say well right i lead one paper a week which anyone can do right may mm-hmm. then like, it's like fine right you can like i can half ass my way around it but if I say I'll write about one paper every day, which means I have to read at least five, if not 10, that's a goal that can actually scare me into like sincerely doing it because now, now like I feel like eyes are on me and I have to like do this properly. So that's how that journey happened. And I, I've been enjoying it. So I plan to say anyway. So is that how you use your goals that you share publicly for motivation? The eyes are on you. You know, you have more to lose in a sense you will take a reputational hit if you don't follow through and that motivates you yeah i think it's it's also about being reasonable right like if i tell you radek i'm going to the moon this year (laughs) like yeah dude how much did you drink yesterday (laughs) well uh, i would say say i'm yes you know given the other things (laughs) you've 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 achieved maybe you know somebody who happens to have a rocket (laughs) or i'm not sure you know I, i wouldn't be surprised and I would just ask you how probably, to be honest. No, no, I think you're being nice. But yeah, like it's like about setting reasonable goals. Uh, mm-hmm. I always do that and then double the number. So mm-hmm. it, like I thought I can do 250 hours of exercise this year, no problem. And then all right, I doubled it. And then I thought 500 hours of studying LLMs this year is possible. Like even if I do like uh, two and a half hours, I can do 500 hours. I doubled it, so like, all right, let's let's do more than that. So now, now I'm scared to actually like do it, and that somehow I always, for the things I pursue, I in retrospect know that I could have set them even higher. Mm-hmm. Yes, the, the, this is amazing because it seems that you're motivated by v- something being very hard, by something being very ambitious. You're attracted to challenges. Okay, I think so. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. 
Uh, and uh, you mentioned also your fitness journey. So you lost uh, 35 kilograms at one point. Yes. Then I gained some, <laughs> but it's okay. Just muscle, just muscle and brain cells. So, so, uh, <laughs> uh, no, that's, is, that is, that is, uh, absolutely, absolutely, um, amazing. Uh, and, uh, going back also to what you said about, uh, papers, using them as a source of information and achieving parity with other people who get their information of, uh, uh Twitter and of, uh, LinkedIn, uh, there's so much hype. So I think you're way ahead of the VCs who, you know, don't have this understanding from the papers, right. Or other people who buy into the hype on, on Twitter. Um, I, I don't know, like if I'm ahead of anyone, I know like I'm, I'm better. I have a better understanding than I did earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> How do you feel about uh, all the hype about AI? It's good, right? Like people complain, oh, uh, all of these crypto enthusiasts are getting into mm -hmm. AI. And I'm like, it's, 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 it's a positive sum game, right? Like the more people get into this field, the more chance you have to distinguish yourself. And like, mm -hmm. Uh, the hype crowd is always at the like tail end, right? Like if you happen to be in the middle of the distribution uh, or on the other end, <laughs> you're fine, right? So the more people, okay. the better, right? Like earlier we had to log on to this discourse forum to like find people who talk about AI, right? Like on past day forums. Yes. And now you can hear chat GPT in like random cafes also and people are talking about it. So it, I, yes. I think it's a good thing, right? That people are coming into this. And uh, what is the application of large language models that you're more most excited about? Like, I know that you mentioned learning from them, right? Helping you with code. But uh, are there any other applications that you see that maybe other people are not aware of that you're most excited? A about? lot of the stuff is under NDA, so. Okay, don't tell, me, don't tell me. All I, right, let, 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 let's 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 no. skip that. So let, let, let's move on to the next question. No, no, I can. Uh, I, that I, comes I, to mind. I can. Huh? I can still answer the stuff that like that's not uh, out there. But I think just having these things run in loops, right? Like if you look back, Open Interpreter was really cool because that mm -hmm. was this uh, infinite thing that could solve a problem, and then agents make really cool demos right now but a you can only do that realistically with gpt4 i have not had success uh trying these things with open source models at least which means they at some point i will be able to that's kind mm -hmm. of cool um and then the general ability of like how much help you get while programming right like all of the frustrating experiences uh, you can take away so like any nowadays anytime like especially with dependency stuff if i'm installing something i just like copy paste the entire log dump and like i don't even read it i just like trust gpt4 and i like i prompt it to like not mess up my system wide stuff in any way and inform me if it's like making a system wide change and that's good enough like now like it's this dependency stuff is so emotionally draining right like when you're trying to be productive and you like just to install that one annoying library you like burn four hours and you like mess up five other libraries that were working and you like then you think about opening a farm or starting a cafe or like man, <laughs> being a writer or some crap like that becoming a gardener or sure. things like this yes yeah. yes yes certainly uh so like i don't want to go back to the world without llms because it's changed how i code to such a degree it's just crazy and uh, I'm having so much more fun by writing code right now than I used to before using LLM. Do you also experience this, you know, joy even, I would say? Yeah, and, because the mm -hmm. cool thing is you have like uh, this, this rubber duck that can also praise you. So if you tell it that, hey, I didn't know this framework and look at this now. 
give you some praise that everyone else on Stack Overflow and phone will be like, yeah, piss off. Like, what, what have you done? This, this garbage is worse than the examples. But huh? uh, in that sense, yes, I, I find a lot of joy that I have this tool that can help me in this journey. But wait a second. So you're talking to LLMs and they praise you. They help you emotionally in working through computer science problems. Am I reading this right? Yes, that's a messy background, but right, like when you're frustrated, that's like a very mm -hmm. messy line because you don't want to like be super invested. But then, like if if you really struggle with something and you got it to work, you can just I'm I, I, I'm like ten charts into the conversation with the thing. Hey, like help me solve this blah 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 blah. And then I can say, look, I got it to work. It's finally working. I'll say, oh, congrats, this is awesome. Blah blah blah, and that. It's better than me just doing it by myself so, <laughs> in some ways. Yes. And then I can say, oh, I hate this. Why is this so hard? And if it's hard, uh, at least GPT-4 and Claude also would say, yes, this, this is hard, but yeah, it's fine. You'll figure it out. That's amazing. And this uh, not being lonely with your code, that's another uh, amazing aspect that you raised, that you're not on your own anymore. You have this uh thing that you can talk to um i'm not sure if you're familiar with uh duck uh, debugging rubber duck debugging yes, yes. okay <laughs> so it's this technique where if you stumble across a very hard problem you find the rubber duck and you explain the problem to the rubber duck and a large percentage of the time you will fix the problem you will realize what's wrong and here the rubber duck can talk to you, can encourage you, and can also provide insights. So that's, uh, that's definitely an improvement. And uh, out of all the LLM papers that you read, is there a particular one that resonated with you? Yeah, but even uh, before answering that, just on your previous mm -hmm. point, I think uh, being in the office, what we really liked was being able to tap the person next to our desk and ask them for help. The part we didn't like was like the other stuff that comes around with it, right? Like we're humans, you have to be nice to other people. Uh, you have to yes. see if they're busy and you can't interrupt them. Even, even if like two minutes of their time like improves your productivity by two hours, it's not nice to see someone who's busy and just drag them. But now you have this like non-living thing which you can be like, hey, come here, like solve this, <laughs> like do it, do it, do it. And now you don't break your flow, even while you're talking mm -hmm. to a smarter debatable smarter being when you're in the flow and you talk to that uh, talk to that thing you're not breaking your flow so i think that's that's pretty powerful right at least for me yes um so, so certainly i absolutely agree on top of that if you're talking to if you have to reach out for help yes they have to be available but it's like i don't want to bother that person or uh, i often ask llms about the very simple things and then they are, uh, I would feel like, yeah, like even if I have somebody to reach out to, I don't want to bother them with, hey, what does this line of bash do, you know, or explain to me this flag or that flag. So that's just an amazing learning environment where somebody can step in and, you know, work with you at whatever level you are. And then you can also discuss much more complex things with an LLM as well. So th this is uh, life changing, uh, certainly. Uh, so from the papers that you read, is there a technique or a particular maybe uh, ability, LLM ability that uh, you find most fascinating? The my, my still today the most favorite paper is like the simulacra of human behavior paper. I think that's the title. Mm -hmm where they created this virtual city of 25 agents powered by GPT-4 and let it run for two months. And the cool thing there was these agents, very blandly so, but they would still evolve and build relations, uh, relationships, relations amongst themselves, become friends. I don't think there were any fights, uh, looking back. So there were no enemies or no, no grudges, but they would become mm -hmm. friends and form even romantic connections amongst themselves so that <laughs> that was a cool paper that's still my favorite paper i don't know what's the use of it uh, but i really like that paper. Uh, did you watch the movie hair 
Yes. About so similar vibes, I feel from. Yeah, but in that a human is evolved, right? Involved, right? Here it's just mm-hmm. agents to agents. Yes. Yes. Um, and do you think that LLMs are a path to AGI? I don't know. Like, mm-hmm. how do you define AGI, right? Do you even and, worry about that or concern yourself with such thoughts? No, because if it's going to be par- more powerful according to one of the definitions and all of the human society combined, <laughs> like, how, like what, what does worry give me, if anything? Like, what's, what's going to happen is going to happen then, right? So, mm-hmm. like... Yeah, like, who am I, right? Like, I can't even get Python 3.8 to 3.10 working <laughs> properly. And then, then some. Yes, it's, it's interesting that in a world where we still suffer with printers and their setup, we at the same time consider whether this technology will give us super intelligence. It, 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 it's a fun thing to to. Just put put uh, in one picture and then think on that. Uh, all right, uh, terrific, uh, Siam. So I wanted this uh, conversation to be a little bit of a celebration of uh, Siam because you're always so humble, which you also uh, demonstrated earlier on. I'm not sure if I succeeded uh, in that, but that that, that has been my my uh, intention. But maybe before I let you go, maybe I can uh, ask you a few more questions um, for maybe some of our listeners. I heard this uh, concern where a person uh, said that uh, uh, talking online, uh, sharing your work is very valuable, right? As you look at your career, you would say that this played a very important role as well, right? Sharing your work. But what if somebody is shy and feels uh, troubled by sharing their work? What would be your advice to that person? I don't person? know. I think I, I think I'm very shy, right? I still am. Like I'm not. I'm still like very socially awkward at different levels, which I can I pass off as being shy. So that's that's the excuse I made. Make. Um, but then what's the alternative, right? Like if you're shy, even at the office, you can have like this uh, evil person take credit of all of your work. And because of your shyness, uh, they take all the money you're supposed to. <laughs> and they keep earning all the promotions that you're supposed to. So uh, user, I think many people have done this. Use a pseudonymous profile, right? It's like, mm-hmm. don't put out your name. That's how I started. That's like, why half of my usernames are init27 and half of them are my name. Because at some yes. point I thought, yeah, like since this is working okay, I'll just name it myself. And then mm-hmm. I initially I thought, I if, even if I'm being an idiot on the internet, let me just be an idiot under that name. So use, use, a, uh, use a, like a pseudo profile, use a username. And then only the username is the idiot and not you. <laughs> That's a great piece of advice. And... I didn't realize that, that that could be one of the techniques. So yeah, that's, that's extremely valuable. And f- for, for a person who's maybe in college right now, or they have their first or second, uh, uh, programming job or uh, machine learning job, how do you talk as an engineer? What should you talk about? Talk about stuff you like, right? Like I, mm-hmm. initially you're like always worried about, uh, and I've seen like, I've seen this by myself and then also because people for some reason happen to ask me questions. I've seen this repeat as a pattern. You're always more concerned about uh, how to write, less concerned about how to write than uh, what to write. And mm-hmm. if like you, you, rather you should focus on how to improve your process than about the what. Because the what uh-huh. should come from your curiosity and the how is what you can focus on to actually improve how it comes out. So again, it goes mm-hmm. back to input versus output. Like what can you control, right? And uh, there's, there's like always a natural flow to things. Some some are better writers by default than others. But everyone has to like go through this journey, I feel, always. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, one other thing, if I may ask you, please. Uh, there was a time when you uh, did a collab with Yannick Kilsher, mm -hmm. right, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And uh, some trolls uh, found the video and shared some things that weren't very kind and that uh, were ridiculous uh, in many ways. Uh, how did this affect you and how did you deal with that? Still, till this, till this date when I'm very happy and I want to like come back to earth, right? Like I go read those comments, uh, <laughs> not, not anymore, but I, I would do that for the longest time. I don't know. Uh, there were like, so A, the reason why like people didn't like that video was A, because like it wasn't good uh, from me. B, if I come on the Radek Osmalski podcast as a host, right? People will mm -hmm. hate me because it's the Rade Kosmalski podcast and what the hell am I doing here as a host, right? So yeah, I think the, it was... The, the, the seven listeners that we get on this channel. <laughs> no, they wouldn't hate you. They, they, they would absolutely love you. But, no, no. but I understand what you're talking about. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm sorry about the few that would, you lose after having me. <laughs> oh, I would gain guess. probably like at least a thousand. Uh, but yeah, that and then... I think uh, all of those comments are valid, right? So some people said stuff like, oh, like, what is this Indian accent? And that's fine. Like, every Indian has an accent. You also have an accent that you don't know. So those didn't phase me. But then people are like, oh, like, he's only a person who talks about AI and he doesn't do research. And then initially I was like very upset by that. And then I was... Mm -hmm. I looked back at it and thought, I never said I do AI research, right? Like, mm -hmm. if you don't want to listen to a non-AI researcher, don't. But, like, as long as I'm being honest, it's fine, right? So that's when it felt okay. In the sense that, uh, sure, these people are used to very hardcore teachers or hardcore engineering stuff. And I'm not that, that is true. But if they're complaining about me not being that, and if I'm saying I'm not that, then, like, the why are we talking right <laughs> yes yes <laughs> yeah. yes okay so, so you thought through some of those claims and so for the empty claims completely logical th things that they were and you just uh, kept on going and you kept uh, uploading videos uh, and in terms of your accent and clarity of speech I think it has improved so dramatically, like your being on camera. Uh, I even remember once I asked you, hey, Simon, what happened there? Because, you know, uh, are you taking any lessons? Are you you're not constipated? Uh, no, <laughs> you're not constipated anymore. <laughs> yes. And and it turned out that uh, it was just practice, right? Just going on video. I think the other part is uh... I would also think about it, but initially you'd always want to offsource editing because it's like one more thing you want to learn. Mm -hmm. But it's it's helpful, was helpful to me in the sense that I like always would mentally make these notes, right? Like of how I'm being on camera. So mm -hmm. there's a problem, right? Like most of us uh, don't stand in front of a mirror whenever we're talking and we don't know yes. how we appear. So you might in your head be coming off as very happy. And then when you look at the video, like, oh, like I look like a pissed off uh, 80 year old. Mm -hmm. And then you know how to express or like maybe improve your expressions a little bit. And then you don't know you actually get to see it in the next video. So then you think, okay, I smiled more, but now it looks cringy. So maybe do less. Uh, that helped a fair bit. So there's a natural feedback loop and the learning mechanism. Very if you listen to, if you if you listen to yourself, if you see yourself, instead of, hey, I just uh, created this video. I'm going to give this to this guy on uh, Fiverr, and uh, they will look through yeah. it. And okay, so you learn from experience. You learn from um, reflecting on the experience. Extremely, extremely cool. So I am. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, honestly, you, you, you're one of the most amazing people I have ever met and you have such a big heart and are so humble to uh, 
uh, go along with, with all those features. So I hope that maybe at least in this interview, we could show some of that awesomeness that uh, Siam is made of. Uh, and you also do amazing things. Uh, so thank you, my friend, for taking the time and uh, looking forward to our future conversations. No, very, very grateful for being on here. And